So, uh, Sarah, it's uh, so nice to have the opportunity to uh, talk to you. I mean, but I think a very important page of your career is uh, how you, uh, how did you start it to uh, interact with the Chinese scholars? Probably, I first went to China in 77-79 as uh, taking tour groups. It was just a way to get to China because um, China was just opening up and, and I took tour groups as a lecturer and you could go there. Uh, but it was only uh, when uh, Chinese scholars started to come to London, I was teaching then at SOAS, that I began to be able to be acquainted with them. And the first, uh, one of the first scholars from China to come to London for any length of time was Li Xiaqin. And, and when did you uh, meet him first? 19, I think it was 1981. He was invited by uh, Michael Lowy to be a fellow at Clare Hall. And um, I remember that and he had already met uh, um, Angus Graham and Paul Thompson, and he wrote to them to say he was in Cambridge. And, he, and so Paul said to me, um, a scholar like this, you have to go to visit him. You don't invite him to visit you. So we took the train to Cambridge and we visited him and we invited him to, to London. Uh, and then, um, because he was interested in oracle bonds, and at that time I had begun working on oracle bonds, I suggested that we go and see the collections that were in Britain. So we, we did that. We went to, we, well, first, of course, we saw the British Library, British Museum, and then we went to um, Cambridge, Oxford, and then we went to Edinburgh and saw the Oracle Bond inscriptions there, and he made records for his own notes, and then he suggested that we collaborate on, on publishing these Oracle Bond inscriptions, and so that was how I first began to be involved with Li Xiaqin, and um, how my, my first collaboration began. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, really rare because uh, uh, we know that uh, the Chinese scholars began to uh, travel, uh, inter yeah. I mean, travel, international travel, and they, they traveled to the United States, turned to Europe, and of course uh, to the UK. But that was a, a moment, I think, uh, when China was opening up, and mm -hmm. also Western scholars uh, were welcoming uh, this new new yeah, uh, yeah. visitors yes it was very rare because uh, and also because uh, e even in britain you didn't have the british academy exchanges yet that's why mm. so so li Chen was the first one of the very yeah. first to go and he had some english which is not too bad english and it improved over the years so and it was very unusual for him to invite i mean it was his initiative to, to, to collaborate with me. And so then I had to find a way to fund it and such. First, uh, so we had to figure out a way to get in a, a exchanges. And uh, I'm not sure, well, I applied to the British Academy, I think, for some of the money for him to come back in the first beginning of it. But then we needed funding, so what we did was, and this was again Li Chen's idea, we established an exchange between SOAS, or specifically between the SOAS, or it was then called the Far East Department, and the Li Shishuo, and, and particularly the, the Xinqin, Xinqin Shi. So the first one to come after I was, was Chiu Wenxin. So Chiu Wenxin was a student of Hu Ho Xuan, and in fact her father is a very famous scholar, Chi Se He. And um, we need, in order to publish the Oracle Bonds, we needed to have rubbings. And in Hu Ho Xuan's project, which was the He Ji, they had, the group of them had gone to do rubbings. So the idea was that she could come over on a scholarly exchange and do, but she had to do the rubbing. Of course, it was very hard for her because she'd done rubbings with a whole bunch of people and you do it for a few days. And she had to spend almost a year doing nothing but sitting at a chair going like this. We started, we, first I had to get permission to get to do the rubbings. 
And I went to the British Library and Francis Wood and Beth McKillop were there and Francis persuaded her authorities to allow the rubbings to be taken and their conservation department. And once that happened, then the other institutions in Britain, there were altogether 11 institutions. If the British Academy Conservation Department said it was okay, then they did it as well. So, because we had to get all these permissions and then she had to physically do these rubbings. We, we all worked out in different ways, but the book very much reflects her own work. And from my own point of view, when she came to Britain, uh, my husband was in, in uh, California because we didn't have much space for him to work in. And so she lived with me. And my Chinese, spoken Chinese in those days was not very good. So, but every day we had to work with she, she did not speak a word of English. A few words with her every day and we were at home, spoke at home. And so my level, my Chinese came. Her, her Putonghua is very, very standard, very beautiful, in fact, and very, very clear. All her tones are clear. And the other thing that happened is that although I had begun my studies on Oracle Bones, auditing courses by David Keatley, and then I had self-studied, um, I wasn't systematically trained. So, but I, I tried to read every Oracle Bone that we put in and discuss with her uh, what they meant and whatever. So that's, for me, this was a, a tremendous opportunity to... And you two also became uh, really good friends. We became really good friends, yes. Uh, and, uh, so after this uh, Oracle Bone uh, project, you and Li Xue Qing, uh, I believe, uh, went along to do further projects. Uh, I think you traveled to, you did Oracle Bones in, in Stockholm, uh, Vision Forest and Antiquities, right. and also you visited all the museums with Chinese bronzes. Right. It so, also resulted in some publications. Yeah, so there were two things that happened from this. Uh, one was the collaborations that I had with Li Xu Chen, and the other was the result in terms of the exchange. But in terms of what happened with Li Xu Chen, so we finished doing the Oracle Bone project, and, and um, one interesting thing happened with that was when, after the transcriptions were complete, and I was in, Felicia Chin and I both went to a conference in, in California, and they uh, ended that conference, we went to my mother's house in Bolinas, north of San Francisco, and uh, he stayed there in, in my mother's house, and my husband and I were staying in a house nearby, and then we went over all of the transcriptions together. Uh, and then after that finished, and it came out in 1985, it was published by John Washuji. Yes. And one of the points that I thought was important was that it was published in China. Well, for one thing, it would have been very difficult to publish it in, in the English-speaking world. But another thing is that that made it available to Chinese scholars. And in fact, one result of that publication was that uh, other oracle bone collections began to be published, whereas before the Hoji, but the other ones, so even in Russia and other places, they began other places in China that had their own collections, yes. they were in Hoji. So other people started publishing, mm -hmm. so it set a precedent for that too. And then, so um, after that was finished, uh, Alicia Chen and I were, we'd always been looking at bronzes too, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, I, this time was my initiative. I got the idea of doing something on, on bronzes in Europe. And I applied for funding. I got a very small amount of funding, but it was just barely enough and for us to spend two months traveling in, in Europe. And we went to uh, the museums. I mean, we were very... <laughs> we were on very, very low budget, uh, and but we we had a time like to research cheap hotels, and we went from one cheap hotel to another cheap hotel. Sometimes they invited us, and uh, people would invite us out to eat. That was good, <laughs> and so but we managed to visit the Western museums with bronze collections. And people were so kind to Chinese then at that time. Everybody was so happy to meet a Chinese scholar. And Li Xu Qin was very 
able to talk to people. And when he would visit the museums, he would always explain to them why the, the artifacts were important. And the curators were really happy because somebody... Yeah. They, they, I mean, were, they, they uh, may not offer them a head in the scene or met with the Chinese scholars. Yeah, yeah. And, and also they learned from him. I mean, that was his... Uh, too, what uh, what was what, and and people were really curious and and really um, interested, and of course I was more, in some ways, a, on the side of it. I remember one incident that I remember particularly. We went to Stockholm. Well, there are two things about going to Stockholm. We went to Stockholm, so we didn't try to get all the bronzes because we didn't have that kind of time or money. So we just selected bronzes that we thought were interesting. Uh, usually I selected ones where the more stylistic or the motifs and he selected ones that were uh, he, he knew were unusual in terms of their form or, or inscriptions. He thought when we started that there would be a lot of bronzes that had unusual inscriptions. That turned out not to be true because most Europeans selected for the art. I mean, bought, they weren't so interested in inscriptions. But when we selected things that were unusual. The thing I remember about that trip especially is that we were going to go to East Germany mm -hmm. and at that time you couldn't, it, it, it was very, you could go to East Germany but it was very difficult. And you, the Berlin Wall was still up. Yeah, still the Berlin up. Wall was still yeah. up yeah. and so you had to book a hotel before you went and it all had to be planned out and so we did that in London. And I wrote to them, I, all the curators I wrote before we left so that they would know that we were coming and prepared for it. So I wrote to them and nobody replied. But we went from Stockholm, we went to Malmo, which had some bronzes, and then we were going to take the ferry in the morning. It was, it was daylight savings time had changed. So we, missed the boat. Oh, okay, so we didn't go. <laughs> so we didn't go and we had to wait till the evening to go. So we waited for the evening to go. So we got there the next morning and they thought we had got there the afternoon before. So as soon as we arrived almost, they called. I mean, they knew we were, they knew the hotel because I'd written them and where we were staying and they immediately called us and invited us, you know, to, and they invited Li Shichin to speak and and show we, we were able to see the, the bronze collection and and um, it was it was very interesting to me because um, you had somebody from China that was still very much behind the Iron Curtain mm -hmm. and you had East Germans and they mm -hmm. were meeting with one another and they were very and the East Germans were very interested to know how much China had opened up it, it was a, a moment I think China uh, began to change. Yeah, it was the just at the, the 80s. Just at the point it began to change, yeah. and of course things were starting to change in, in Eastern Europe too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, almost like a coincidence because uh, you working on the same kind of uh, uh, interest in the same kind of subject, and uh, Li Xueqing, of course, he, he was such a broad scholar and then with uh, uh, so much knowledge, and but you two came together and then really uh, start to have a really uh, long-lasting working relationship so, yeah. and a friendship yeah. that changed yeah. uh, a lot in your career and uh, many other sort. Right. Well, another thing that happened besides the relationship that I established with Li Xuqin, and Li Xuqin was remained very important in China in terms of promoting uh, international re relations. Uh, both with Europe and with the, with the U.S. But another thing that happened early on that I think was important was that in order to do the first Oracle Bond project, we established this exchange. And so soon after this, the exchange was established, the Leisure School sent other scholars, and among the first scholars were Zhang Gong and Song Jiayu, who were both Dunhuang specialists. And they came actually right after we published um, Ingo Sotra and Jaguji in 1985. I think it came in 1986. Anyway, about that time. And um, they were working in the British Library on the Dunhuang manuscripts. And so they proposed a publication, a uh, joint publication, 
on the Dunhua manuscripts. And of course, uh, it's too big. And so they, they suggested the Fei Fu Jiao, the, the non-Buddhist manuscripts. And of course, this was too big a project immediately. And, uh, but I remember there was some sort of reception and Abraham Liu, who was there, and I was telling him about this, and he said, well, how much money do you need? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and I didn't think this whole thing was possible. So after he asked me the third time, I said, well, um, I don't know, maybe 10,000 pounds or whatever, I have to, to think about. But, but he approached then uh, Elizabeth Moore, and she had something called the Sino-British Fellowship Trust. And that became a, a very important funding opportunity for these kinds of projects. She, it was her money, she decided how much to be spent. Uh, she had been in China early on and she wanted to help Chinese scholars. So we then started this Dunhuang project. Of course, I'm not a Dunhuang scholar. And in fact, Li Xu Chen warned me, he said, if you get involved in Duhuang studies, you'll never get out of them. <laughs> so Francis and, and, and Beth, and you, that was when you came to Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that that's uh, the time I was uh, kind of in London, because I came to London uh, in 86, yeah. and uh, met with you, and then I think uh, I began to read your works and uh, began to also start to translate some of them. That's mm -hmm. how I started my kind of a first education of Western Sinology mm -hmm. and got really involved and then uh, began to uh, work on archival inscriptions with you. And of course, Li Xu Qing was there, so mm -hmm. really had a, such a great opportunity to study with him too. But it's uh, interesting, I mean, just my experience of, because I was translating your uh, The Shape of Turtle. <laughs> right. That time, uh, I, I think I started with some chapters as uh, conference papers uh, you, you presented at uh, Chinese conferences. And so when did you uh, attend the Chinese academic conferences? And uh, when you give your paper, uh, what kind of reception you got from Chinese scholars? Well, they, the interesting thing in that regard is that uh, I think it was a little bit different than the kind of experience that people had in America, but at that time there were also British Academy exchanges. And I went to, on a British Academy exchange to China, again we were was working on the Oracle Bond project, um, but it was after I already started that. And I, I, every place I went to I was asked to give a talk. And so the first one I gave at the Li Shuswar, the, the Institute of History, and I couldn't, I, I, my Chinese was better than it had been before I met with Chiu and Xin, but I was not terribly confident of it. On the other hand, uh, I was gonna, I decided to talk about um, structuralism because I published the Air and the Sage, and I knew nobody was gonna be able to translate for me. So I thought I would better speak in Chinese. And I remember very distinctly going in this room, it was very cold and, not, and everybody was still in their blue suits and my comprehension wasn't very good. And I was very nervous and I looked at Li Xu Chen and Xu and Xin and they were even more nervous than I was. And I suddenly realized that I had to do this well or it's not my, only my face is going to be lost, it's going to be their face too. So, um, but I managed to get through it. and. Mm -hmm. They asked a lot of questions and I was really surprised. And, uh, but I managed to more or less answer them. I, it, 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 mm -hmm. I could understand what they wanted. And after that, I always spoke in Chinese. And, um, so, and when I did the tour, then I gave talks in Chinese. So when I went to the first conference, I had already given talks mm -hmm. in various places. The first conference was at Anyang, and David Keatley and um, Nevison and Sean and other people came. Uh, but I remember, and I talk, gave, gave a talk, it was essentially the paper, the first chapter of, of, of The Shape of the Turtle, 
which was the same as the article called The Sons of Sons that I read. And um, they, were, they, were, they were very interesting. And I've always found that to be true. I think one of the reasons is that the materials that I was using were materials that everybody knew, but the interpretation was different and the theoretical background was interesting to them. So the fact that they knew the materials and then they might have read about structuralism or heard of structuralism, but they couldn't understand what it was about. So when they saw me try to apply it to Chinese materials, then they could get the idea of what the theory was, which if they were reading about the theory as applies to Western materials, it was too difficult to understand. So I always had very good reaction. And in fact, um, one of the important things for me with working with Felicia Chin was just that he was interested in what I was doing. And the fact, that very fact met, was very important to me because I wasn't at that stage in my career getting a lot of reaction Mm -hmm. uh, in, among my colleagues in, in the West. So. Yeah, and, uh, I just remember uh, I did translate your uh, another chapter, the shape of Ya. Yeah. Ya yeah. And then, uh, then I remember Yu Xue Qing particularly comment on that, said, oh, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned to many other scholars. Yeah. And remember when I finished the translation of your manuscripts at that time, the English edition was not published yet. Of the shape of the turtle. Yeah, yeah. shape of turtle. Uh, then so many Chinese scholars who came through London or met in China, they all read it. Uh, I remember Gao Ming, mm -hmm. Ning Ke, and uh, Fan Yu Zhou, and uh, several other scholars who kind of, uh, even just, uh, uh, I think by correspondence, like uh, Yuan Ke, the yeah. uh, mm -hmm. scholar on mythology, they all actually made uh, uh, very useful comments mm -hmm. and suggestions. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing was about working with you on the translation, and of course you were still a student, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I remember that I said you had to read all the original mm -hmm. materials yourself, but the questions that you asked mm -hmm. helped me to, I, in some ways to revise English script, but also to, I ch sometimes change the Chinese because what the, there's always a difference between the background that a Chinese reader has and the English reader. So, so, so if you're a Western Sinologist, there are certain things that we assume that you would know that you didn't no, know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And so then I would put in add in words, but there were also other things that were too simple. Mm -hmm. So in the Chinese translation, rather than using the original first chapter, which was an introduction to Anyang about Chinese archaeology, which was too simple for, for Chinese sinologists. But uh, I put a chapter in, a, an introduction to the theory that the would explain... Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. yeah. yeah. so I think uh, that uh, kind of, uh, I mean, it's uh, such a, a book, I think it changed a lot of uh, uh, yeah. scholars in China, the way they think of the own history or the study. Mm -hmm. So that uh, was a major, mm -hmm. uh, major achievement. <laughs> it was people. also one of, I think, probably the, f it must have been the first, uh, or one of the first Western sinological works that were published after the Cultural Revolution, I think. Yeah, for sure. And, and also, I think uh, uh, so many people, even today, you know, after so many years, people still reference to it. Mm -hmm. Even get people say, oh, uh, do you have the early editions? Like, uh, <laughs> when it is published by Sichuan Yi Chu Ban Shi, and of course later on it's uh, um, published again or printed in different uh, uh, editions. But uh, yeah, so later on, Shang Wu and Shu Guan is now published mm. uh, all my work, yeah. and then I added uh, some work that was related, some essays that were related mm. to it mm. to the as appendixes. Mm. But that also brought it back to people's attention. I think before that. Younger scholars knew the name of it, but they hadn't actually read it because they couldn't. Mm. It wasn't that easy to get. Yeah, but now they started to read it again. It's quite gratifying from my point of view. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, um, in the nineteen eighties and early nineties, uh, London, or 
Degree Service was their place for the study of early China. And you organized so many different activities. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I remember because I was there, you know, through all these activities, projects, mm -hmm. I met so many Chinese scholars who mm -hmm. I later become friends, and they had a huge influence on my own studies too. And so can you just describe uh, what's the situation like then, yeah. and uh, how, how did you manage to do all these things? Well, what, what happened was that once China opened, uh, at SOAS, uh, and in England generally, people, we, we had these visitors came, came and when I, I First was Li Xiechen, he was specially invited. But then there were various exchanges and Chinese scholars came to London. And also uh, Angus Graham was there, he had a lot of visitors. At first, Di Silao was there, but then he went to Hong Kong. And um, I think it's important to remember, it's very hard for people to realize what it was like. Uh, these people had all spent years in the countryside. The Cultural Revolution had ended, but they had been spent 10 years not being able to do any real work. And suddenly they got an opportunity to go abroad. And um, they were the, of course, the people that they selected to go in the early times, these were the people who were most, had the most prestige in their, in their field in China. And we suddenly had access to them. And so what I did was to create a forum in which people could give talks because they were there. And so we started this early Chinese seminar. And I think it was, there are a lot of early Chinese seminars now, but this was probably the first one. And um, it was an informal seminar. Uh, we, it, we didn't have any money. Uh, I applied to the British Association for Chinese Studies to be able to put their name on our seminar, but they didn't get, we didn't have any funding and we didn't have any administrative help. So if there was somebody in London that, was a, that we wanted to hear talk or if we wanted to give talks ourselves, um, we, we created this forum and we would call up people on the phone, we didn't use computers and say, um, we're going to have a seminar, <laughs> would you like to come? And, and besides SOAS, there was also the British Museum. And Jessica Rawson was at the British Museum, and she had visitors too. And so she and her visitors also participated in our seminar. And there was the British Library, and there was the Victoria and Albert Museum. So we had, there were, and then uh, Cambridge, uh, Mark Lewis and Michael Lowy would often come down, uh, and Oxford, sometimes people would come. So. Um, we had an audience, and if you're a scholar and you are interested in your what more can you want than an audience to hear you? So people were really glad to give talks. And also, I mean, having gone to the trouble to get abroad, they, they wanted to make their ideas. Yeah, I remember public. just uh, the names like Gao Ming, yeah. and Chu Xigui, uh, and uh, all the uh, scholars who came because uh, uh, yeah. through this uh, program or the yeah. kind of uh, the all give talk at the early China seminar. Yeah, yeah. Cho Shi Gui was there for two months and uh, you worked with him on yes. your dissertation. But it's also uh, archaeology. I remember Wang Xu, Wang Yarong. Uh, yeah, so th that was part of the... Wang, Wang Xu and Wang Yarong were, were part of the exchange with Alicia Suo. And when we started the Dunhuang project, again, we didn't really have enough funding and we used the exchange that we had already created. And Wang Xiu and Wang Yarou are extremely interesting people. They, they, they were textile and costume specialists and they had worked with uh, Shen Song Wen. But before they were the Li Shu Suo, they were at the Kalbo Suo. And the Kalbo Suo, and they did, they photographed on exhibition, on, on excavations. And, um, often ones where they might have textiles, but often they didn't have textiles, so that would be what they did. And so they were invited to do the photography of the Dunhua manuscripts. But um, they had worked with so many archaeologists and they knew everybody and they knew had so much information and arranged for them also to spend time at the V&A so they could do some of their own research. And, um, 
it was, uh, I learned so much from him. And Wang Xu was somebody who was interested in the practical aspects of things as opposed to... He was one of the, I mean, could say he, he's probably one of the best excavators. Yeah. Anything uh, people couldn't handle, I mean, like a, a Fa Men Si, yeah. he was one open the last That's layer exactly. of the casket. Yeah. And Hong, uh, Longshan and the Hongshan culture, yeah, he was there. And, yeah. uh, and the Ma Wang Dui, I mean, he's an amazing guy. Right, yeah. I, I just, uh, today, uh, I still, every time I think of him, just, uh, I just full of uh, admiration. Yes, me too. And also, he was so generous in terms of introducing archaeologists when we travel to China, both for you and me, and that was... Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. the probably the main reason kind of I got to know all the archaeologists and uh, got really involved with, mm -hmm. uh, with archaeology uh, in a quite uh, in-depth way. Yeah. yeah. And, and Gaoming, uh, Gaoming was there for, uh, on a, in different hospitals, he was there for a long time, and so he was then doing translating, or trans, doing the text, not translating, of course, but uh, the Ma Wang Dui Lao Tzu that he did for Zhonghua Shu Ji. And so he was working on that then. And so we had a special seminar for him in which we all read the Lao Tzu together. That's right. And that set the precedent for the later work on, on the Gordian Lao Tzu. Right. Uh, and it, that was really, really an event. Uh, but the, the, there was this, this continuous stream of scholars uh, was a fantastic opportunity to learn. And, uh, and also it was very informal. So uh, I would call up people and then we would get a room and we'd have the talk. And then after the talk, we would go to the pub. And then after the pub, we would go to, the din to dinner. And... Um, at dinner, the rule was that everybody paid but the speaker. <laughs> the Chinese were a bit shocked when at the end of the talk, we all take out our money and start counting it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they found it very strange. I remember Yu Taishan uh, was one of the visitors from the Lisha Swan. Um, Yu, Yu Taishan worked on uh, Northwest area in later period, but uh, and in fact, a lot of his works have been, been translated by Victor Mayer, so he is known in, in the West. But uh, he was so disappointed after he gave his talk when we went to this Indian restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was there when Li Xueqing was there. Yes, yeah. And they used to go, yeah, he was there when Li Xueqing went. They would take walks every, every uh, evening after dinner. And for Yu Taishan, that was the major event of being in London. Uh, from that moment, I think uh, you almost traveled to China once or twice a year. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I would travel to China. Usually I try to go to a conference in some uh, more remote place and then go, not necessarily remote, but not in Beijing. And then I would travel to the museums and archaeological sites in that area. And then the Lisa saw uh, became my Dan Wei, and so they would always give, you know, give me the introductions and arrange for somebody to go with me, in fact. So often some of the young scholars or graduate students would go with me. Uh, sometimes I traveled with Li Xueqing, but, but the old Qi Wenxin, if they could do it and didn't have other, other things that they needed to do, and, and if they didn't, so uh, some of the young scholars that are now very senior, uh, I got to know early on when when they were students and they would travel with me. Yeah. So there was uh, an exchange, genuine exchange, uh, I'm talking about scholarship, because at that time okay. uh, you did not have much funding to pay for right. uh, right. a curious accommodation or anything, because uh, for some of them who actually uh, went to the United States, uh, they had much better funding, you, yeah. but when they came to London, it yeah. uh, was very basic. That's very uh, basic. Um, well, they, they lived pretty basically at home, but they also lived pretty basically there. We mainly put them in the, in the student dormitory, which was close to SOAS, but that had the advantage both for SOAS and for the, uh, the students that 
there would be students studying Chinese there and maybe some Chinese students. And so they had, most of them didn't speak any English. And so we were able to take care of them even though, and, um, even though we didn't have an apparatus to do it. And it was very good for the students and our seminars, the students could take part in or not take part in, and that was up to them. Um, Yes, that time, uh, the, certainly I saw us, I mean, the structure kind of uh, was uh, rather uh, loose. I think yeah. uh, you yeah. were allowed to do uh, whatever you wanted to do. I yeah. believe that uh, was the advantage. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't have any status, so there was no way that I could do it if I was using the records, you know, the structure of the institutions. So I just did it. And everybody came along <laughs> and and so it, it we created this this atmosphere but you especially but other students graduate students everybody crispin williams uh later on and and um colin mckenzie and and uh, a number of jillian simpson who didn't continue in the field but a lot of the students took part in this and so it, it was an opportunity for students, and then that also relieved the pressure. And it was, I mean, I think it was very exciting for everybody at that time. It was just... the, let's go back a bit about this uh, Dongfan project, right. because uh, I believe it brought so many scholars to London, and they, because it was uh, uh, true Fan Dongfan studies. Right. Uh, there were so many uh, scholars got involved. I remember Rong Xinjiang, um, Fang Guangchang, yes. and all the others. They, they all came. Yeah, they, they came out. So the idea with the Dunhuang Man, with the Dunhuang project was uh, it was following on, on the Oracle Bomb project. And so the idea was to publish these documents. So Francis Wood and Beth McKellar uh, persuaded the British Library that. Um, to do it and obviously there was some reluctance because China claims these manuscripts and so what we argued was well if they're going to be in Britain they should be able Chinese should at least be able to read them and the fact that it was a collaborative publication would reduce the tension about the the, the, the manuscripts being in Britain because it essentially if the Chinese were publishing them themselves in collaboration with the British Library, then uh, this would uh, be good for international relations. And so the, the library agreed. Um, and that eventually resulted in this big international Dunhua project. Yes. And so the, the French uh, published theirs and everybody started publishing theirs and it's all online now. But it started with this um, very, <laughs> um, poorly funded uh, scholars project to do this. <laughs> and I, my role in it was simply as a facilitator. I wasn't academically involved in, in the Duhong manuscripts, but I did, uh, by that time I had some kind of experience in organizing these things. So I did do most of the organization. It took a hell of a lot of work, but it did lead to uh, this larger project. And I think one of the things that's important to to see now is that our field, early China field, has become a very collaborative one. And I think that the reason that has happened uh, is that it's because of these early experiences. So that the Chinese scholars, they went back to China, other foreign scholars came, they were willing to spend time uh, working with them, teaching with them, and to some extent we took this for granted. Uh, at that time they were coming slowly and the field was changing, but not at the rate that it's changing now. But you you had better control or understanding of, of, of the materials than, than anyone can have now. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are all sorts of collaborations all over, and there are all sorts of collaborations all over the world now. Uh, but it's part of the way the field has grown up, and I, I uh, like to think that I made some kind of contribution to that. Yeah, that's huge. I think uh, now even felt uh, mm -hmm. 
much stronger than it was then. Because yeah. uh, when you were doing it, you, you were not aware what impact it would uh, have. Oh, but yeah. now, looking back, I think we can see that clearly okay. now. And uh, another uh, page of your career uh, is when you left London, left SOAS, and came back to the United States. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. But the way you uh, carried out collaboration uh, did not change. I already was working with, with, with people at, in China, mainly at the Leisure Swap, and of course, Li Shui Chen went, moved from the Leisure Swap to Tsinghua. Uh, after I, I got to to um, to Dartmouth. So when I moved to Dartmouth, one of the things that happened, and this I mentioned that we had this conference with Gao Ming, and then uh, just after I got to Dartmouth, I went in ninety five. Uh, there was a reports of a Lao Tzu that had been found. And the first reports were completely wrong. But in they, Hubei, yeah. In Hubei. There was a newspaper item about uh, Jingmen, like a tomb robbery or something. Started. Attempted tomb robbery yeah. and a Lao Tzu had been found and it was supposed to be a conversation between mm -hmm. Lao Tzu and something, which was not true because they just didn't put the slips together right. But um, Bob Hendricks, Robert Hendricks was at Dartmouth in the religion department and he was interested in in the Lao Tzu, and, and there was a Taoism conference that he and I were both invited to, and um, it was rumored that they would report on this Lao Tzu, so we both went there, and they didn't exactly report on it, but they read uh, something that from Peng Hao, and Peng Hao was one of the major excavators of the Gordian tomb. And so um, he was in London, that's why he wasn't there. So I immediately contacted you. <laughs> yeah, Peng Hao, I think he really played a major role because I, I met him, I remember, in, in China through Wang Xu's instruction. Right. He was first. a close friend of Wang Xu. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's, that's right, when the things were found, uh, back to Jingmen, and right. he was in London. So when he called me, asked me, he said, oh, let's work on that. The idea uh, was quite unusual because uh, I think uh, you were trying to get a conference before the publication of the material. Right, so the idea was that we would have a conference when the, uh, at the time that the manuscript was published. And uh, Peng Hao was very, very helpful in that he wrote in his contract you know, that it had to be published in a certain time and that would, we could put everything together. And for this, I needed to get funding. So, um, Dawkins gave me some funding, but it wasn't enough. So I also went, to, or, well, was it, it wasn't that it wasn't enough. It was that they said that I had to apply for outside funding too. So I applied to the Luce Foundation and I got money from the Luce Foundation, but it was for a bigger project. They didn't fund conferences, so I had fund, applied for a big, project on excavated tax. So for that first conference, um, the idea was that we would read the Lao Tzu together and uh, half the scholars were to be from China and half were to be from the West. And we, uh, we selected people with different specializations Taoist philosophy, um, the Lao Tzu specifically, um, paleography of certain types, and it, it was all sort of laid out. And um, Peng Hao was absolutely essential to it because he was the one that did the, the, um, the, the first transcription. Yes. And you were working with yeah. him in London on it. Yeah. So uh, everything was just sort of getting in order to do this and we sent out the invitations and actually everybody we invited agreed to come. And um, on the Chinese side, we had both Gao Ming and, and Cho Shi Gui as well as Li Shu Qin and, and a bunch of other people uh, too. And so, um, so one problem was that people needed to read the text before 
we had the conference over, it wouldn't be very productive. So, and it would, but people couldn't write papers because we weren't going to have the, you know, the, the, the manuscript that early. So we managed to get the manuscript um, two months early, or the, I don't know if it was the manuscript or the proofs, two months before, and then that was sent out to the participants. <laughs> so the question was how to organize it. So I was quite, <laughs> I was quite pleased with myself with this one because I, I assigned every scholar two slips to read. That's right. <laughs> and I felt like I was the king of the world. Here was. Uh, Choshi Kwe, these are your two lines. Li Shichin, these are your two lines. Gao Ming, these are two, your two lines. And um, um, Jim Feng Han, and uh, so all of these eminent scholars I, I told them, and, and everyone could say whatever they wanted to besides reading these two lines at the time that they were called on. Uh, and it, it worked beautifully. Yeah, it was a, a memorable uh, yeah. moment. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't remember any conference as that as such kind of a so where uh, organized in the way people had the real contact with the texts. That's what yeah. everybody enjoyed, and then they can talk about what yeah. the the ideas. Yes, uh, uh, and and it, it was totally new. I mean, everybody, nobody had talked about these things before, and and um, everybody was so excited. I remember that. I had invited the president of Dartmouth, who was James Wright, to come to the conference. And he couldn't come to the opening, so he came in the next day. And we were waiting for Gaming to start talking. And the room was totally silent. He was so astonished <laughs> because we're, everybody was so uh, aware, you know, ready to hear what he was going to say. And I was so excited about it. It was really for me, that was the, the um, it was for me too, it was the most exciting conference I've, I've ever been to. And all sorts of issues were that were brought up then. Um, now, some of them now appear naive, but that was because you didn't have the material that you now have. Uh, and the combination of, of Western scholars and Chinese scholars and everybody from different fields looking at it from different angles and um, different approaches to transcriptions. Gao Ming and Xiu Guay obviously had very different ideas about how to transcribe things. Um, and then then we recorded it and um, Crispin and I worked on the on on from the transcriptions to produce the book, and with the book, I tried to to um, bring out the issues rather than just publishing it as transcriptions and say what and record what people had said about this issue at that time. So that then became a sort of the first. It was the first book about um, about these new Chuslet texts. Yes. And not only was the first book about this, I mean, at least in English, it was the first book. There were, I'm sure, things that were faster in China. Oh, there were, actually. In, in fact, Xingwen did a, a bibliography. The, the number of books that had been published the first year after the Gordian publication was just astonishing. Yeah. But um, the Gordian, uh, the Dartmouth Conference was uh, certainly the first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, publication was a bit later, but uh, the discussion yeah. and it's how it started because yeah. that, and that also and there was a Chinese the, translation of right, it too. Yeah. translated into Chinese and um, so that was very interesting to people too that how everybody was discussing with each other how this and one of the things I found in in reading conferences is that conferences where you actually read text together have the advantage that you can bring in your ideas, but because you're talking about something that's specific, if people come from different backgrounds, you can still discuss it. And, and that gives a way in which people from different backgrounds, not just be they Chinese or from some Western country, but also people who are in philosophy or people who are in archeology span or whatever, um, 
a focus that allows an interchange of ideas that is hard to get otherwise. And, and so we, we did some later conferences too, but that, that first conference was really um, an amazing event. <laughs> so after that, so, because the project you uh, got funding, and then I remember almost like a second part of the conference was uh, uh, taking place in Beijing, together with Beijing. Right, yes, yeah, so... Li Bo uh, Qian, uh, Mr. Li Bo Qian. Yeah, Li Bo Qian also came to the to the Guodian Conference, of course, and um, representing sort of the archaeological faction uh, and Peng Hao. Uh, so what happened was when I applied to the Luce Foundation, they didn't fund uh, conferences, so I, I applied for a larger sum of money. And at that time, there were a number of texts that had been excavated, not as um, significant in some ways as the the Gordian find was particularly significant because they were texts that related to the philosophical historical tradition that everybody knew. But there had been other kinds of texts, some on bamboo slips, uh, the, the Meng Shu that were on these slate tablets that Crispin William worked on, and um, a, a variety of other things that had not been published. Yeah, some discoveries in Hubei, I remember uh, Wang Jiatai, Wang Jiatai, uh, Suli. Suli, and several other places new that they were not published. So uh, the conference you organized together with Li Bo Qian in Beijing, yeah. I remember that conference because it, uh, it took place at this amazing <laughs> place or a place with no number uh, street number <laughs> we call it Dayuan, Dayuan the, 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 obviously the people that were from Be Beijing they didn't stay there but all well, the people came from other places we we stayed there and um but we were sort of in this garden was we held the conference and uh so what we've done about these other texts though the idea was uh to encourage the publication of these texts. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's the same kind of thing happens amongst archaeologists in the West too. Um, often something's found, the archaeologists are busy with other things. Uh, in in uh, remote places, often they didn't have the expertise to do the, to do the transcriptions and, and it, they got overlooked. The Shanghai so, Museum, uh, Ma Chen Yuan came because they got a, uh, uh, right. A lot of uh, bamboo sleeps. So he right. presented uh, uh, the the work. Uh, Masterman presented, and they had an exhibition for a week of the Kung Su Shi Lun, and right. that was the first uh, public uh, thing about the the Shanghai slips, and so there was a lot because that was very exciting for everybody, and that was a much bigger conference. Than, than the the one we had in in, uh, in Dartmouth, we couldn't restrict it that much. I mean, we I think there were around a hundred people, uh, which was already too many to have the kind of discussion we had. But uh, the, the the various excavators and scholars presented the texts that they were working on that hadn't been made public, and and most of them now have been published, although not quite all of them. Mm -hmm. other... You also. Uh... After those, you also did other conferences uh, at Dartmouth and even in Europe. Yeah, so, well, there were several things. I mean, at Dartmouth, one of the things that happened at Dartmouth is that also I began to get uh, visiting scholars from China when, they, when that, that's, uh, so there were usually a number of young people there uh, that, that I worked with, but also, um, I, I People came to Harvard and I invited them, or Boston University, and I invited them to Dartmouth, and we would have small conferences. Uh, as, and um, uh, Shingwen did some publication with this newsletter uh, that, that reported on them. And so uh, we, I mean, for example, uh, we call it the ex gong xiu, and the, the bing gong xiu, or sui gong xiu. Yes. Liu Yi, uh, because came he, to that. Uh, he, he gave a paper. Uh, yes, so uh, and he, he showed began, it to me. Yeah, yeah so he, he not only gave a paper, so again, we did it as a reading conference. So, and um, Louisa Huber 
discuss the style and whether what you would think from the style about the authenticity and the dating of it and we 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 um, approached it from various uh, points of view and so it was the same kind of idea which was that you take something specific and you bring people together that have different approaches to it but you discuss it with enough specific specificity that um, everybody learns from it because other people have different approaches and different ideas and different knowledge about it uh, and then you go home and think about it on your own so so some of these uh, workshops we did at Dartmouth people came even from Europe at their own expense so I would just let people know that this was happening by that time we had computers I didn't have to uh, telephone people. Um, I mean, I would telephone a couple of people that I wanted to make sure knew about it and would come, but um, I, I think they were very productive too. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So, um, as the Jujian field developed, then there were a couple of other big conferences that I did. Uh, one of them uh, was on the Tsinghua slips and uh, a large delegation came from Tsinghua. It was at Dartmouth. At Dartmouth, yeah. I read that the Tsinghua conference was 2010. 2010. Yeah. And um, so they brought a large delegation and um, the idea of the, one idea of that conference was simply to introduce this material to the West. And they also had uh, an exhibition at the United Nations uh, where they showed photographs and things about the, 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 the so that we had an exhibition in the library. They allowed us to have the same exhibition in, in the Dartmouth Library just for a week or so. And uh, we, again, it was a reading conference and the Sheenian was mainly the basis of it. Uh, and then we had another conference that Michael Ludke in, in um, in Germany, organized in Germany on in 2016. And that again, we did a reading conference. And uh, that again was a large delegation from China, not exclusively from Tsinghua, but people came from other institutions to people who were writing on the slips and on the ones that we read at that conference. But, and uh, it was very interesting to see how the field had developed. Sarah, uh, in your career, you have worked with uh, uh, many senior scholars, uh, Chinese scholars, like Li Xueqing, Chu Xigui, Gao Ning, but you have also worked with a, a number of Chinese students, uh, including me, and you helped them uh, in a big way uh, in the career and academic research scholarship. And that goes back to London, and you have mentioned some of them, but you uh, also did quite a bit uh, in the United States. Uh, you worked with uh, many students, Chinese students from Tsinghua or other institutions. Uh, do you want to say so, a few yeah. things about that? So Dartmouth is an undergraduate college, and of course, uh, so there were no graduate students for me to work with there. I'm, I'm very proud and pleased with the, with the fact that uh, several undergraduates that I taught at Dartmouth uh, are now in the field. Uh, Nick Vogt, uh, Christopher Foster, um, Billy French, uh, and some others that aren't in early China field, like uh, Chris Ray, went on into, into this field. Um, but the other thing that happened at Dartmouth was that they started, the, the Chinese government started this, this CSA program, the Chinese Scholarship, whatever it's called, so that uh, people could apply and or still can apply in China to study abroad for a year. And it's mainly doctoral students or young scholars, uh, uh, postdoc or, or just starting out in their career. And um, over the past decades, since not 95, I went to, to Dartmouth, uh, quite a large number of those students uh, applied to come to Dartmouth to work with me and they were usually there for a year and there were usually more than one of them and um, 
it was a lot of fun uh, because I would work with them. We would have a little seminar. Uh, sometimes there were Chinese students doing um, like, um, uh, sometimes there were Chinese students doing master's degrees in literature or something like that that would join in or other and other faculty members. So they were very small, maybe four or five people, but we would meet every week or so and they would talk about what they were working on and I would try to help them see what the resources were and tell them what the Western literature was that they might read and such. And um, they came from all kinds of fields. I mean, they were mainly, mainly the people I accepted were people whose work impinged on my work in some way. But my work is very, um, has been, my interests have been very broad. And so they would impinge on it, but they would have a whole other field that they knew about that I didn't know about. And so um, the discussions were very interesting. And I was able to help them, but also there was, <laughs> it was more fun than teaching uh, in graduate school where you're responsible for the student's future. I mean, these students, I helped them and I learned from them but I didn't have to worry about, they had their supervisors and their jobs at home. I didn't have to worry about trying to help them get jobs and writing all these yeah, letters. I'm, I'm, and I'm very proud of them. I'm very pleased with them. And they're all over China. They've got jobs all over. A lot of, a number of them were from Tsinghua, particularly the doctoral students. Uh, so um, I established a relationship then. As originally, Lisa Saw was my Dan Wei, and I still, um, in my heart, the Visha Soil still has a special place, and I like to go back there. But I also didn't now have a relationship with the uh, the the Jim the Jim Bo Zhongxin, the the um, excavated text center at at Tsinghua. And a number, particularly of Jiao Pingan students and Li Chen students, came to work with me. And those were doctoral students, and I and I was a joint supervisor of, in, in in many of those cases. And then as I go, go back to China, I still keep in contact with them. And uh, so now I have there's a, a large group of young scholars. Um, I think maybe there were 30 or so over the years that, that did this, that I now know and, and um, uh, so feel like in the, the, I mean, they are in the future, future. they are yeah. the future. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Sarah, I mean now, uh, you are retired from Dartmouth, but you are not retired in research or scholarship now. You are resettled at Berkeley. Berkeley yeah. uh, what's your plan? Any anything you can share with us? Well, I'm, I, I've moved to Berkeley now, and uh, it's been COVID since I moved here, so I haven't been able to do much with with uh, the university yet. But um, Michael Nyland and Mark Chicks and me, I are here, and, and uh, obviously very good graduate students in a good library so I hope more from more of that I'm, I'm a visiting scholar and also um, I've just received another uh, distinguished visiting scholar uh, at the Zhongxin the Center for Excavated Text so that will go on into the future and I'm collaborating uh, Does that require you to teach at Tsinghua? Not to teach it requires me to be there at least a month a year I mean, I think it implies informal teaching of graduate students. If there's no actual courses that I think that, as far as I know, <laughs> that I would be responsible for. I assume that they would ask me to give a certain number of talks or whatever. But it's open-ended in, in a way. I can stay there, you know, up to a year for a month to a year. And um, the other thing is that one of the visiting scholars, uh, Handing, from Henan University, uh, we're now doing a book on Chinese art in the first millennium BCE. So I've gone back to one of my earlier interests, The Shape of the Turtle, and looking at, at some of the issues that were raised in that. In, in my last book, Buried Ideas, uh, I used the excavated text to re-examine questions that had arisen in my very first book, uh, The Air and the Sage, and now I want to look at some of the issues that, that I thought about those many years ago in Shape of the Turtle. And uh, then I hope to get back to Jim Bo. <laughs> but yeah. the wonderful thing about early China field too is that there's just so much, it just becomes 
more and more interesting as there's so many new kinds and they've changed the way that people are looking at things. And um, at my age, it's a bit discouraging because you realize that you're, it's very exciting when you're getting things for the first time, but people's ideas about them are going to be very different 20 years from now than they are now. But um, the challenge of, of uh, trying to rethink uh, a lot of the assumptions that people had, uh, not only since I started out, but you know, in all through Chinese history, um, or at least after the Qing Dynasty, there's been certain assumptions that have been made about the ancient past, and now we have these new texts that actually come from the ancient past as well as new material evidence and how to put them together and how to think about it. Um, it's an, it's, it's an, these are questions that will never end and it's, it's wonderful to be uh, a scholar and in this field. As we see now, the field is so diverse, but right? yeah. um, so many uh, scholars, younger, older, they come from different angles. But I think uh, for everyone who uh, does research in field, they will recognize uh, what you are doing. And I'm sure in 5, 10, 20 years time, looking back, um, the significance of everything uh, we have achieved will become even more noticeable. Thank you. That's the Intang Jia Gu Qi. That's right. That's, there are four volumes of it, and it's got uh, the title is in uh, Chinese, and when we have the Eng we gave it an English title as well. And the first two volumes, as as we were discussing, the first one came out in 1985, and then the next two in 1991. Uh, well, let's talk about the shape of the turtle first, because that's the one that you that you translated, and uh, there's the original tra Chinese translation. Yeah, Sichuan Renmin Chu Ban I remember I translated in the, during 88-89, but it came out in 1991. One. Yeah. And uh, the English... Sunni. Is published by Sunni, and then this is the Shangwu publication. So now Shangwu has published all of my work in Chinese. It it's is Ai Wenji. As Island Wenji, and there's also a Korean included, uh, translation, translation. Uh, that was done by O Man Zhong. So, my first three books uh, the, the Shape of the Turtle, The Air and the Sage, and um, Of Water and Sprouts of Virtue yeah. have all been translated by O Man Zhong into Korean. And then there was, we talked about the Gordian Laos. And I didn't remember the title of the Chinese translation. So the, it is Gordian Lao Tzu. It is Gordian Lao Tzu. Right, yes, yeah. It is your right to dialogue between scholars uh, from East and the West. West. And yeah. that was a collaboration with Crispin Williams, mm -hmm. as was the English one. Yeah. Um, and it's an early China uh, special uh, monograph. monograph. That was an early China special monograph, yeah. We did. Oh, this. That's the uh, bronze book. This is the bronze book. Ojo Suo Zhan Zhang and we gave it the English title of Chinese Bronze as a selection from European collections. And it was out of print for a long time, but it's been reprinted oh, recently. That's about that. And this is the, the, or this this is the Stockholm uh, collection. Museum Antiquity, the collection you mentioned. Radiant. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this book again is you, Li Xu Qing, Qi Wen Qing. Yes, yes, and this one, uh, again, Chi Wen Xin was, uh, should be considered the major, the large portion of the credit, I think, really needs to go to Chi Wen Xin, and she doesn't always get uh, the attention she deserves for it. Um, and then they, we did these conference volumes uh, for the Qinghua. Qinghua Jian Yan That's the... Conference volume for Dartmouth. No, this is the one. This is the second one. This is the yeah. one we did in in uh, with Michael Ludke in Germany. Oh, this uh, is Germany. This one. Yeah, and this is the one. The first one oh, we that's did right. that's with uh, and and the the Dayu and Conference volume. Yeah. Your new book, Buried Ideas, it's also been translated into in Chinese, Chinese now. Yeah. yeah. So I can I can see from here. That's the yeah. That's, that's, that's the one. That's, that's the one. Yeah, and this was translated. In fact, 
by um, a Dartmouth graduate student, Tsai Yu Chen, and um, we worked on this one. And, and in fact, the visiting, a lot of the visiting scholars uh, helped with the translation and we discussed it in those seminars I was talking about. Uh, so it came out now. And all of these, most of these uh, Shangwu editions are a little bit different than the early editions because I added extra materials. So if I'd written essays in English that hadn't been translated into Chinese, or some even had been translated into Chinese, then I added them to the, as appendixes to the Shangwu editions. So now I've probably published more in Chinese than I have in English because there are articles that I published in Chinese that I never published in English. I can see it's uh, number five. five so yeah. Uh, um, we so, need to see number six. Number number, number six will be the Shang, oh, Shang, Shang Art, Art book. Okay. Yeah, the, 